George Cordes of the Adirondack Lakes Center for the Arts in beautiful Blue Mountain Lake, New York, in the heart of the Adirondacks. And I'd like to welcome you to the next live stream event in our Alka-Seltzer series, Online Relief from the Headaches of Social Distancing. During its 53-year history, the Art Center's mission has always been to present, promote, and celebrate the arts, both in our beloved historic building and throughout the Adirondack region. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, we started this online series so that we could continue to connect with our audiences, both near and far, despite the fact that, for everyone's safety, we are temporarily unable to gather here in person. Our virtual series this summer and fall has included concerts, workshops, the visual arts, and even elements of the Adirondack Lakes Summer Theatre Festival, which unfortunately has been postponed to 2021. A wide range of activities that reflects what the Arts Center has offered and will offer again once the danger of COVID-19 has passed. Thanks to all the talented folks who have been and will be part of our Alka-Seltzer series. And to you, our supporters, though we currently come into your homes through your smartphones and laptops, we look forward to when we can all gather again in person to celebrate the arts. Victor Herbert was born into an artistic middle-class family on February 1st, 1859 in Dublin, Ireland. His mother and his maternal grandfather were the two people who shaped him into the man he became. His father had disappeared in 1862, presumed dead, while on a business trip to Paris. Fanny Lover Herbert, his mother, then took to traveling throughout Europe with her two portable bathtubs and three children in tow. The children were tutored in the various cities that they ended up in, and Victor spoke both German and French fluently and had a good knowledge of Italian and Spanish. Victor's grandfather, Samuel Lover, who was born in Dublin, 1797, was proficient in a variety of art forms. He wrote farcical, racy novels of Irish life, which were classics of their time. In fact, Victor Herbert's speedboat on Lake Placid was named the Handy Andy, in tribute to the best known of Samuel Lover's novels. Lover left Ireland to join the artistic life of London. He was an artist and portraitist of note. Some of his work is in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery in London. Lover also composed two operettas and wrote the librettos for at least two others. He was especially known as a singer of Irish folk songs and had compiled an evening's entertainment called Ireland in Song and Story. Samuel Lover toured the U.S. and Canada from 1846 to 1848 with this wildly successful and lucrative program. When he returned from his American triumph, Lover moved to a large new home in Kent, 
England called Seven Oaks. It became a salon of sorts and a gathering place for artists and musicians of the time. Tiring of her travels, Fanny Herbert brought her children to Seven Oaks to live with her father. Victor was surrounded by art, music, and love. He watched his grandfather paint and was present when musician friends sat down to play various instruments. His grandfather made sure that he never forgot his Irish heritage. Victor later wrote of this time, particularly singling out a cellist named Piatti. As he neared his teens, Victor's mother and grandfather decided he should go to Germany for schooling. The strict course of study at the Stuttgart Gymnasium suited him, as did the required musical studies. It was here that he discovered the cello and was such a natural that he joined the school orchestra after only two months of study. His genius was apparent and he was soon sent to study with a cello virtuoso in Baden-Baden. Soon Victor was forced to make his own way as his grandfather died and funds from that source had disappeared. For the next four years, Victor traveled all over Europe as a cellist with many orchestras. At one of these engagements, he was encouraged by a fellow musician to study composing. He returned to Stuttgart in 1885 and took a position with the Royal Court Orchestra to be able to study harmony, orchestration, and counterpoint with its conductor, Max Seyfritz, a friend of the great composers of the era, including Wagner and Liszt. Victor quickly started composing classical pieces for the cello. His earliest pieces were performed in Stuttgart by the Royal Court Orchestra, receiving good reviews. More importantly for Victor was the orchestra's engagement to accompany the court opera. At an August 1885 rehearsal, he spied Teresa Furster, who had been hired as the lead soprano. The erstwhile bon vivant and playboy of Stuttgart was a goner. He started courting her with poems and passionate letters. They were married in Vienna, Austria in August of 1886. At that time, Teresa Furster was an international opera star specializing in the German repertory. She was approached by the fledgling Metropolitan Opera of New York City to perform for the 1887 season including the role of the Queen of Sheba on opening night. It is unclear if Victor was hired as a cellist for the orchestra as a condition of her employment or on his own merits. Nonetheless, the couple set sail for New York with contracts for both of them. Teresa was indeed an opera diva of the first magnitude. Not only was she the star of the Metropolitan Opera's opening night, she went on to sing the lead role in four other operas that season, ranging from Verdi's Aida to Wagner's Lohengren. The next season, she only sang one performance as backstage politics at the Met caught up with her. Undeterred, Teresa returned to Vienna for the summer season and then came back to New York to sing for a rival opera company. After the 1888 season, Teresa retired from the stage to devote herself to motherhood, her husband, and his career. In October of 1889, Ella Victoria, their first child, was born. One of her legs was withered and she usually wore a brace and walked with a limp. Clifford Victor followed two years later and Maud, who died in infancy, was born in 1893. There were also two stillborn children. Teresa never sang professionally again, but there is no evidence that she resented giving up her career to support Victor. In fact, one of the leading ladies of Herbert's operetta said that Victor Herbert's devoted wife created Victor Herbert. Teresa gladly smoothed the way so that his genius could flourish. Oh, 
Herbert was a young man of great self-confidence, tremendous energy, and work ethic, looking to make his mark. He had arrived in America with several of his classical compositions for cello and orchestra. These works and new ones were soon being played on tour with Victor Herbert as soloist and occasional guest conductor. He was finally having success and earning enough money, but he still had greater ambitions. Although he considered himself first and foremost a composer, Victor Herbert was willing to take on any job connected to music and had aspirations of conducting a large, prestigious orchestra. During this time, he played at the Metropolitan Opera, was an assistant conductor at the New York Philharmonic, conducted the musicians at a music hall, orchestrated other composers' work, gave private lessons on the cello, hired out as an accompanist, and was on the faculty of the National Conservatory of Music. Now it is time to digress a bit to set the stage of the America and New York City that welcomed the Herberts in 1886. At that time, German was the second most spoken language in America. The classical music scene was dominated by the Germans who shared a common language and were obviously disposed to help and hire each other. A large section of the Lower East Side was known as Little Germany. It abutted the area around 14th Street and Union Square, a center for entertainment, from grand opera to music halls to risque shows that often drew the attention of the police. Woven throughout the various theaters were bars, cafes, and restaurants. In the mornings, the members of the artistic community would spill into the streets to meet up with other performers, critics, and intelligentsia for a 10 a.m. coffee and pastry or a lunch washed down with Pilsner beer. Something of a dandy, always formally dressed in a morning coat, Victor Herbert strolled through this hotbed of creativity and rubbed shoulders with many of the famous and not so famous of his day. He was good company, generous to a fault, and well liked by his contemporaries. Herbert's personality, a rare mix of kindness and power, energy and a touch of Irish pig-headedness made him unique. He was a lovely man with a fine sense of humor, a great man with the heart of a boy. It just so happened that Victor Herbert entered the American music scene at a time of great growth and change. For years, most classical music was imported from Europe. Wagner, Puccini, Verdi, Mozart dominated at the opera houses. There was homegrown music at the grassroots level. Light musical entertainment was not very sophisticated and tended to have a coarse streak of sexual innuendo and unclothed chorus girls. America was beginning to want its own music and Victor Herbert was ready to supply it. Victor Herbert's musical background of Irish folk tunes, classical training in Germany and Vienna, exposure to the Waltz King, Richard Strauss, and the operettas of Jacques Offenbach gave him a unique background that allowed him to compose effortlessly for the Broadway of his time. Gilbert and Sullivan light operettas had become wildly popular in England and were beginning to be performed by the Bostonians, the best American light opera company. In 1893, Victor Herbert was approached by the English librettist Francis Nielsen to write music for an original operetta, Prince Aeneas, for them. He accepted the job and wrote a score that worked well enough to tour for two years in the Bostonians' repertory. Victor Herbert had accepted the job as much for the pay as for the artistic fulfillment. However, artistic and professional satisfaction had finally found Victor Herbert. He had found a means of expression that completely suited his personality and his talents.
Herbert was trying very hard to become an orchestra conductor in addition to his performing and composing careers. In 1893, Victor Herbert was tapped to take over the Gilmore Band. This was not the classical musical position that he had been dreaming of. However, the Gilmore Band was the premier pops band of the time. Victor Herbert spent time tweaking the repertory to reflect American taste a mixture of patriotic songs, classical pieces sung in English, his own compositions, and brass marches. It was renamed Victor Herbert's 22nd Regiment Band, formerly Gilmore's. Through the summers of 1893 and 1894, the band played at popular watering holes and beach resorts near New York City. During the other seasons, they gave concerts in the New York City area and undertook short tours through the New England states. The band enjoyed a triumphant but grueling tour in the spring of 1895. This tour gave Victor Herbert credibility and visibility throughout the land. He was established as a conductor. He used every minute of his waking hours while on tour in creative activity. When not rehearsing or performing, he was composing. Operettas that he composed during this time included Wizard of the Nile, The Gold Bug, and The Idol's Eye. Following a pattern established in Gilbert and Sullivan operettas, they were usually set in foreign lands and featured damsels in distress and mistaken identities. Oh! 
Finally, in 1898, Victor Herbert was offered a post he had not sought, but one he wanted, both for the prestige and the remuneration. The three-year-old Pittsburgh Orchestra had parted ways with its first conductor, Frederick Archer, and the orchestra committee chose Victor Herbert from a field of 14 candidates to try and build an orchestra which would compare favorably to the more accomplished and renowned orchestras of Boston and Philadelphia. From the beginning, there was controversy over Victor Herbert's appointment, stirred by the local press and supporters of the prior conductor. Victor Herbert also got off on the wrong foot with the management, who wanted him to move his family to Pittsburgh and commit to a much longer rehearsal schedule than he felt necessary. He stonewalled them by ignoring correspondence as long as he could. However, things were smoothed over, and Victor Herbert and the orchestra manager worked as a team leading up to opening night. A review from the musical Courier, November 29, 1905, gives a good picture of Victor Herbert at the podium. A man is known in the musical world by his musical deeds, and Victor Herbert's musical deeds are the basic element of the fame which he has deservedly won and now so properly enjoys. As to his mastery of the baton, his exuberant temperament chastened by scholarly sobriety, warm imagination tempered by dignified musicianship, and a fine perception of the most subtle musical niceties of phrasing, orchestral combination, and instrumental shading and coloring reveal the powers without which no conductor can hope to be great. Opening night and the whole season were obviously a big success. Next year, the size of the orchestra was expanded, the season was extended by three weeks, and Victor Herbert was given a new contract. The second season was as successful as the first, and Herbert's contract was renewed for 1900 with a raise. In his spare time during these two years, Victor Herbert composed four operettas, The Fortune Teller, The Amir, Cyrano, and The Singing Girl. Working so hard to improve the quality of the playing, Victor Herbert was rewarded with a three-year contract for 1901 to 1904. 
With the stability that a three-year contract promised, all the various grudges and complaints that existed were unleashed. The money men, the orchestra committee, the manager, a few of the musicians, the press, and the claque who had supported Archer all had their grievances made public during the next three years. In a bid for more control and a larger salary, Victor Herbert wrote a letter of intent to resign at the end of the season. His contract was not renewed and he left. Despite the problems, he had endeared himself to the players and the general public, who were very sorry to see him leave. He was never again to be principal conductor of a symphony orchestra. His replacement was a poor choice, and the orchestra suspended operation within four years. Unlike today, opera companies, symphony orchestras, and even the popular regimental bands had very short seasons. Therefore, it was possible and indeed financially necessary for Victor Herbert to have many jobs. After Victor Herbert left the Pittsburgh Symphony, he organized a group called Victor Herbert's New York Orchestra. Similar to today's Boston Pops, they played at various summer resorts. In the summers, they toured to the 2,000-bed Grand Union Hotel in Saratoga Springs and the popular amusement park in Willow Grove Park near Philadelphia, where there was a 4,000-seat venue for concert. Quotes from the period give a flavor of what these events were like. There was in those days a wonderful slow tempo to life. Even the weather was warmer. God, what a lovely time to live. As to the atmosphere at the Grand Union Hotel, music flows towards us from the ballroom in languid, luxurious measures, like warm, voluptuous arms wreathing around us and drawing us to the dance. As to Victor Herbert, using his robust charm, his ready Irish ribaldry, his enthusiasm, which equally embraced his art and his fellows, he created a world that centered on the lodestone of his magnetic personality, proved an irresistible force, and drew thousands of Americans to his concert halls and bandstands. The orchestra continued to tour and perform until Victor Herbert's death. Once Victor Herbert had composed his first operetta, he never stopped composing for the theater. He had his pick of librettists and composed at least one new theatrical piece a year, more likely two or three. By the time he stepped down from the Pittsburgh Symphony, he had composed 11 operettas, including one of his masterpieces, Babes in Toyland. His most successful efforts were clustered from 1903 to 1910. The most accomplished of these works included It Happened in Nordland, 
Mademoiselle Modiste, The Red Mill, and Naughty Marietta, considered by some to be his masterpiece. Not coincidentally, there were four librettists whom he worked with most of this time, Harry B. Smith, Glenn McDonough, Henry Blossom, and Rita J. Young. Review of the Enchantress in 1912 gives a feeling as to how Victor Herbert was accepted by the critics and the audiences. Quote, Mr. Herbert has a happy and discriminating versatility. When he writes patter, he makes it rhythmic and pointed. If he must turn a soubrette jingle, he makes it gay and saves it from cheapness. He writes his sentimental tunes with warm, instrumental voices, yet almost always the melody runs rich and clear. He can make music of light and playful fancy. His marches sound as do Sousa's, but with music. At his best, we Americans may justly match him against the more vaunted composers of Vienna. Unlike many of them, he has a distinct individuality and fancy, and he ranges widely in the matter and the manner of his music. Like them, however, he has a clear sense of theatrical effect and an instinctive and practiced understanding of the musical capabilities and responsiveness of audiences for operetta. Irish exuberance makes his music bubble, while Irish humor and fancy spice it. End quote. Whatever his greed or birth, and a 
maid is a maid, and she isn't afraid of the manliest man on earth. So if you're a fool and you're hoping to rule the woman you're planning to get, then buy the old Harry, be sure when you Throughout his whole life, New York City was home base. The hustle and bustle of the city suited Victor Herbert's type A personality. The Herberts lived in a brownstone on Riverside Drive and 108th Street. Teresa ran a well-managed household whose sole purpose was to keep Victor happy and provide him with a congenial working environment. He could gaze out at the Hudson River as he composed. The Herberts entertained their musician friends with Viennese food and evenings of music among themselves. Victor was a real social animal with many friends and few enemies. He belonged to many clubs, frequented German restaurants, and was generous to those less fortunate. He enjoyed spending time with musicians and other composers and would pass on tips about composing and orchestration. In the late 1890s, the Herberts discovered the Lake Placid Club. The whole family spent parts of the summer there until 1902 when Victor was able to build Camp Joyland with the profits from babes in Toyland. Lake Placid was a spot where Victor could really relax and enjoy his family while continuing to compose in his small studio on the second floor of Camp Joyland. The studio enjoyed a vista to the lake. In those days, Signal Hill had few trees as a result of earlier forest fires and logging. Surely, Victor was not here continuously every summer, but he must have spent considerable time here as the Herberts brought their chauffeur and household staff from New York. Victor walked every day, usually with Ella, and enjoyed running his motorboats on Lake Placid. Subsequently, he built Camp Sunset, two lots over from Joyland. He purchased the existing camp, Woodland, that was between the other two. Presumably, he acquired these two other camps, hoping that his children would be near him in future summers. His son became estranged from the family and never really came to Lake Placid as an adult. However, his daughter, Ella, used Camp Woodland until the end of her life. Victor did get used from the camps during his lifetime, as he frequently invited his librettist up to work with him away from the summer heat of New York City. Oh! 
Victor Herbert's creative time was now largely focused on composing. Composing is putting the notes to paper that will be played or sung. Orchestrating requires the composer to expand his original melody for all the different instruments of the orchestra. This was Victor Herbert's true gift. At that time, the musical entertainments being performed on Broadway had large orchestras, usually more than 40 musicians. He was able to compose and orchestrate at lightning speed. He could write new music between afternoon and evening rehearsals. He could even orchestrate a new number in that time. His ability as an orchestrator sometimes camouflaged the lack of quality of his weaker compositions and papered over hackneyed librettos and scripts. He never ceased to compose and continued to work until the day of his death. Despite his success in the popular theater, Victor Herbert still wanted to compose a grand opera. The producer, Oscar Hammerstein, put up $1,000 to find a libretto for him and ultimately chose the tale of an Indian maid, Natoma, set against the backdrop of Spanish California. Natoma was burdened by a pedestrian libretto, but on the strength of Victor Herbert's name, toured throughout the United States for two years. The fact that it has not entered the American repertory, despite being written in English, probably speaks to its lack of quality. This was Victor Herbert's one attempt at a full-length opera. Stung by the reception of the opera, Victor Herbert went right back to working on operettas. He had even composed three during the two years it took to get Natoma on stage. Victor Herbert had a real sense of his own genius and value, but tended to have a thin skin where criticism was concerned. He was involved in a number of suits for libel against well-known music critics and publications. He also kept a sharp eye on the financial side of things and was constantly suing producers for financial or artistic reasons if he felt that he was owed money or the integrity of one of his works had been violated. Of course, producers have not always been known for complete honesty. In 1909, he visited Congress and took part in the writing of the Copyright Act to protect artists' works. In 1914, Victor Herbert and other famous composers and writers met at the Lambs Club in New York City, a club for members of the theatrical profession. The meeting's purpose was to form a union to protect their intellectual property. The American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, or ASCAP, was the result. At that time, there were no laws to protect musical intellectual property. Formerly, this had not been a problem because the only way to enjoy music was at a live performance for which the composers and librettists received royalties or through the sale of sheet music for which the composers received a portion of the profits. With the advent of the piano roll, followed by wax cylinder, vinyl records, and then the radio, there were many opportunities for songs to be reproduced and enjoyed all over the country without the artists receiving any remuneration. Victor Herbert organized groups from ASCAP to travel to Washington, D.C. to parade down Pennsylvania Avenue and to testify in front of Congress. Twice, he paid his personal lawyer to argue briefs before the Supreme Court to protect the intellectual property of the artists. They won the day, and ever since, composers and writers have gotten a fair share of the profits generated by their creativity. In 1916, Victor Herbert was asked to write a score for a silent film, The Fall of a Nation, a sequel to Birth of a Nation. This was the first full-length original movie score. He composed a score to be played live to accompany the eight-reel film. Victor Herbert spent months working on this piece. Reading his correspondence with the film director-producer, one is struck by how he understood the task of building a film score even though he was composing the first one ever. One is also struck by how little understanding the director had of composers and musicians' problems. The film premiered to mixed reviews at the Liberty Theatre in New York in 1916. The film is now lost. In 1991, musical specialist Wayne Shirley, using a piano score, reassembled the existing orchestration which was at the Library of Congress in a disordered state. The score was played that year in concert at William Patterson College in Wayne, New Jersey. During the later years of Victor Herbert's life, he continued to compose operettas. 
He also composed incidental music for the Ziegfeld Follies and other types of popular music, but time and public taste were beginning to pass him by. The changes were hastened by the First World War. New musical styles, especially jazz, made Victor Herbert's scores sound dated. It wasn't as if he had fallen into obscurity. His works were still being staged, and he was still taking his orchestra on tour. The formula he used for his operettas was no longer fresh. His main body of work had started with music for vaudeville shows, moved through pastiches of Gilbert and Sullivan works, and then, at its best, produced some wonderful, completely coherent works that charmed his audiences. His heyday was from 1897 to 1914. During that time, he produced more than two operettas a year, many of high quality. Over his lifetime, he composed 43 operettas. Although his later work was not as well received as the most famous works, it still was produced and made money. Even today, there are occasional productions of his operettas. His best operetta scores were turned into films, frequently with scripts that bore no resemblance to the original and did nothing to enhance the reputation of the operetta or Victor Herbert. His last produced orchestral work, A Suite of Serenades, a series of pieces written for a jazz orchestra that unbelievably were not jazz themselves was paired on a program with the first performance of George Gershwin's jazz masterpiece, A Rhapsody in Blue, in a concert conducted by Paul Whiteman at Aeolian Hall in New York. One can only marvel at the irony and sadness of that evening. Victor Herbert was sitting in an orchestra-level box, as was his wont. One must wonder what thoughts went through his mind as he heard the first chord of George Gershwin's concerto. During this time, Victor Herbert was obviously composing less and was very involved with his union activities and now had more time to devote to his passion for the land of his birth, Ireland. He was an officer of a couple of Irish organizations, the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick and the Friends of Irish Freedom. He worked and networked until the day he died. It's true that I'm susceptible to ladies. It's true. After a morning spent composing, meeting his music publisher and the producer of the Ziegfeld Follies, he met cronies for lunch at the Lambs Club, where he was in a very good mood, joking with his friends. After lunch, he felt ill and was driven to his doctor's office where he collapsed and died. This quote from The World sums up his career. Losing Victor Herbert, the musical world loses someone it will never quite replace. He was the last of the troubadours. His musical ancestor was Mozart, and the family of which he was so brilliant a younger son numbered Offenbach, Delieb, Bizet, the Strausses, and Arthur Sullivan among its elders. What he had was what they all had, the gift of song. His music bubbled and sparkled and charmed, and he brought the precious gift of gaiety to an art that so often suffers from the pretentiousness and self-consciousness of its practitioners. 
The 30 years of his too short career have left us two grand operas and over 40 operettas and musical comedies, all distinguished by an unending flow of melodic invention, harmonic and rhythmic individuality, and brilliant instrumentations. His daughter, Ella Herbert Bartlett, took charge of the funeral arrangements. She had Victor Herbert dressed in his usual formal morning coat with a green vest and tie. The funeral procession formed at the clubhouse of the American Society of Authors, Composers, and Publishers. The cortege was headed by the police band playing the Chopin Funeral March, and the hearse was flanked on each side by a squad of soldiers from Governor's Island and by a company of Marines from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Then, in order, came members of the Lambs Club, the Friars, the Lotus Club, the Irish organizations, the Musicians Union, and a detachment of the 102nd Engineers, formerly the 22nd Regiment. The cortege marched past large crowds, eight blocks up Fifth Avenues to St. Thomas's Episcopal Church. The pallbearers included Jerome Kern, John Philip Sousa, and George Gershwin. The ushers included Irving Berlin. A granite mausoleum was built in Woodlawn Cemetery up in the Bronx, where Victor, Teresa, Baby Maud, Ella, and her husband Robert Bartlett are all buried together. Ella Herbert Bartlett worked hard to protect her father's legacy and make sure that he was not forgotten during her lifetime. She was an astute businesswoman and kept a lookout for any use of her father's compositions without payment of royalties. She kept artistic control over the films based on Victor Herbert's operettas and the film that was made about his life. Radio programs kept his work in the public eye well into the 1950s. Ella bequeathed as many of his scores as she controlled to the Library of Congress. The scores had been divided between the two children, and the ones that Clifford took are not completely accounted for. Ella's will created the Victor Herbert Foundation, which perpetuates his memory through funding productions and providing scholarships. The American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers was the driving force behind the 1927 installation of a bust of Victor Herbert that stands to this day in Central Park. Ella unveiled it at a ceremony attended by Irving Berlin and many other members of the Lambs and ASCAP. On February 1st, flowers are always laid at this monument. At the dedication, Mayor Jimmy Walker said these words about Victor Herbert. I remember Victor Herbert when he was leader of the band of the old 22nd Regiment, when I was just a New York kid. We boys used to think it was the finest band in the world. As long as the human voice shall sing, as long as human hearts respond to melody, the genius of Victor Herbert shall exist. Here, where the people of the world come to make their home, Victor Herbert brought all the romance and imagination of his heritage. Center for the Arts in Blue Mountain Lake, New York. And if you'd like to help us continue our programming, please consider giving a donation at our website, adirondackarts.org. Thank you, and have a great evening.